Good evening. On behalf of Starkloff Disability Institute, I want to welcome everyone to our finale celebration of the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. My name is Katie Fields. I am the College Outreach Coordinator at Starkloff Disability Institute, and I'm honored to emcee our event this evening. We are very excited to present tonight's event featuring Galen Lee in concert and conversation. Before we get started, I want to go over some of the technical aspects of this event and tell you a little bit about Starkloff Disability Institute. Tonight's event is being recorded and is going to be available on our YouTube and Facebook pages to share and enjoy again later. Please note that captioning and interpreting services are available throughout this event. If you need access to either of these features, we ask that you please refer to the guide sent via email earlier today. Please feel free to use the chat box to talk with other guests throughout the evening. And if you have a question for Galen, we ask that you submit it using the Q&A feature. If you see a question from somebody else that you would also like to have answered, we ask that you give it an upvote and we're going to prioritize it during the conversation portion of the evening. Starkloff Disability Institute works to create a world that welcomes people with disabilities through pathway to, pathways to employment, um, education, and universal access. July is Disability Pride Month, and this year marks the 30th anniversary of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act on July 26th. Our campaign for this year's celebration is Diversity Includes Disability. Throughout the month, we've hosted events that have advanced local and national conversations, exploring how the many identities a person has, such as disability, race, gender, and socioeconomic status, interact to shape their experience in the world. You can learn more and watch recordings of all of our events at starkloff.org slash ADA30. There you can also sign our ADA recommitment pledge and check out our Disability Pride t-shirts for sale. Now, please welcome acclaimed singer, songwriter, and disability rights activist, Galen Lee. When Galen won NPR Music's 2016 Tiny Desk Concert, for two decades as a hardworking and talented Minnesota musician finally crystallized in a beautiful moment of national recognition. It was also the, just the beginning of a grand adventure. With the wind of her award at their backs, Galen and her husband Paul sold their house, quit their jobs, bought a van, and hit the road. Since then, Galen has played over 425 shows in 42 states and seven countries, adding nearly 100,000 miles to their Ford Ecolines odometer. The singer, songwriter, and violinist has graced the stage of renowned venues like Nashville's Music City Roots, the Kennedy Center, House of Blues, and even BBC World News. Galen has released three full-length solo albums to date and has recorded several EPs over the years. She's released her latest single, In the Midst of the COVID-19 Pandemic, an instrumental improvisational piece aptly titled Rebuild. In addition to performing and recording, Galen has taken to global stages to talk about disability awareness, accessibility in the arts, and living an enriching life. She has a congenital disability called osteogenesis imperfecta or brittle bone disease. Galen is a strong voice in the disability community. She uses her music as a platform to advocate for people with disabilities and to promote positive social change. Galen, we are so happy to have you here with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, and happy ADA 30 to everyone in the audience. Um, I'm grateful to be here. Thanks, Katie, for the introduction. Of course. Um, tonight, Galen's going to be playing some more songs for us, and then we're going to have the opportunity to chat for a bit after. So please use the Q&A box to submit any questions you would like to ask Galen later. Um, she's going to be taking breaks in between songs to answer some of those questions, so um, submit them at any time. Galen, it's all you. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, yay. So thanks for joining us all tonight. Um, and thanks to Zarkloff um, Disability Institute for making this event possible. Um, I am going to play a number of my own original songs and end on a traditional number. So this first song is a tune that I wrote called Watch the World Unfold. And it is about uh, not being so hard on yourself when you make a mistake. So here we go.
pushing up, pushing up. Do the dirt just like a seed, but you're never quite a flower. You feel more just like a weed, driving through, driving through. You wanna know where you are going, but the windshield's always dirty. I can never get to see what makes you think that you'll ever get there. What makes you think you deserve to know? Who are you really? Are you so important? Take a look around and watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. Need advice? Need advice? You have no clue what you're doing. Moral compass it is spinning, an identity unhinged. Where to turn, where to turn, there's so many opinions, and they're all a little different, and the outlook getting dim. What makes you think that you'll ever get there? What makes you think you deserve to know? Who are you really? Are you so important? Take a look around. And watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. Watch the world unfold. Watch the world Pushing up, pushing up, through the dirt just like a seed, but you're never quite a flower, you feel more just like a weed. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kaylin. Thank you. I'm going to check one audio setting really quick. <clears throat> Do you think you could press more down there in the corner? Um, if you click on this link, sorry, just going to make sure of something. Just click on more, right there, but I just can't. Oh, yep, it's good. Okay, we're all good. I just had to make sure when I shut off my mic earlier that I didn't mess anything up. Did you have a question for me, Katie? Um, so one question to start, uh, what or who motivated you to play violin? Um, well, actually, it was an orchestra that came to my school um, when I was in fourth grade an orchestra came and played for the elementary school, and I just fell in love with the way that it sounded, the whole group of strings together and watching the bowing in synchronization and something about it was very magical. So I went home that day and told my mom, you know, next year I wanted orchestra. And she was scared because she's like, I don't know how that's going to work, honestly. But she didn't tell me that. She just said, if you really want to do it, you'll figure out a way. Um, and I got very lucky in that the next year there was a teacher um, who was willing to work with me. She said, I've never done this before and I'm not sure how it will work, but I feel like you should learn how to play because you're very musical. So let's experiment. And we tried all sorts of ways to hold the violin. Um, I couldn't do it on my shoulder because my arm is too short. Um, I couldn't do it, um, you know. The real cello was too big, and I couldn't hold my bow like a cello player, but we decided I could play my violin up and down like a tiny cello and hold my bow like a bass player does. And so that's sort of um, how we finally came about it, and I just fell in love with it and kept doing it ever since then. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And I am going to really quick do a visual description. I forgot to do that when I started. And I apologize, but um, just because 
especially the way I play is very different. So um, I'm a white woman with shoulder length brown hair and um, I'm wearing a green pattern dress with um, little pigtail buns on either side of my head and a purple flower clip in my hair. Um, and then there is, I'm wearing some black feather earrings and I'm seated in my electric wheelchair and the, I play the violin up and down like a cello. So it's kind of in front of me that, like that. And I hold my bass or my bow like a bass player, as I said, and I have in my wheelchair a metal box. And this is for the whole audience because um, nobody ever knows what I'm doing here. I have a looping pedal in my wheelchair um, and it's a recording device. And so I push down on the left button with my leg when I want to start recording. And then I let go the second I want the loop to start repeating. And um, you'll hear that same thing I just played again and again and again. And then I can add more and more layers on top of it. And that's how I build up all these layered violin sounds. And so um, it's sort of like a little orchestra, but it's all recorded live. And so it can either be really cool or go terribly wrong. And you never know until you're in the middle of the song. So there might be a messing up point. Well, hopefully not tonight, but that's just kind of the nature of the beast. But the, uh, the looping pedal allows me to play solo. Um, and I'm going to do another song for you now. It's called Let It Go. It is not from the movie Frozen. I wrote it a year before Frozen came out. And um, I shouldn't have named it that maybe in retrospect, but I had no idea. Um, and it's about letting go of traumas from your past. So here we go. <laughs> When the smoke clears, when the dust settles, where do you go? Who do you know? When the damage is done and it blocks out the sun, to whom do you run? To whom do you run? Let yourself.
There we go. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any other questions, Katie? Um, so we got a question in that says, as an artist, my disability is a part of my process. Do you find the same thing in your process? Oh, interesting question. Um, you know, I think the way my disability interacts the most with my music is probably through the lyrics. Um, you know, having brittle bones disease, you'll go a really long time without a break, or at least in my case, I do. And um, all of a sudden, in the middle of nowhere, your life changes very dramatically um, when you break a bone or two. Um, and then you have to kind of change your sights for the next six weeks while you recover. And it's always, it always feels very drastic. And I think that that realization of that like life is very impermanent and also can change um, you know, we're all very mortal and it can change uh, in a blink of an eye. I think that realization has crept into a lot of my lyrics and I know that my disability informed that part of it. Um, the other way my disability interacts with my art is just obviously through the performance part. Um, because I have an electric wheelchair, it's a lot harder to find venues that work um, and are really accessible. And so that's become a big part of my career is just trying to be a better advocate for accessibility in the arts. And that's not directly related to the art that I make, I guess, but it definitely um, is where I feel a big overlap between my disability and my identity as an artist. So that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess I'll do the next song. I'm glad that Katie's doing questions in between because um, I am doing all singing songs today and they're all pretty dark. So it's nice to have a little break in the middle um, to chat. Um, so this one is called Someday Will Linger in the Sun. And it is uh, the song that I entered into NPR Music's Tiny Desk Contest back in 2016. It's already been four years, and I don't know how time goes so fast. Um, but this song, um, after winning the contest, we were able to start touring because it was such a big boost. Um, I had only ever played in Minnesota before, and now we've been quite a lot of other places, and it's all because of this one song, which is about how love is beautiful even if it is difficult or complicated. So here we go. Gotta make sure all the right buttons are pushed or we're in for a surprise. So here we go. Thank you. 
was so beautiful thank you thank you very much i think that's one of my favorite yeah. songs of yours yeah it was so uh surprising to have that one resonate with people because i'd really only ever played in my hometown before then and you know people are familiar with all the songs and you don't really get a lot of feedback i guess from your friends and family so um i'm glad thank you i'm glad that you like it do you have any other sure. questions for me yeah, so we got one in, and you kind of addressed it a little bit, but this person asks, do you write and sing your own music? If so, what is your creative process? Oh, yeah. Well, I started out when I was first performing, like, in front of audiences. I actually played um, looping, live looping versions of traditional fiddle tunes. So my first album is almost all traditional melodies kind of reworked with all the layers underneath um, to be like a more modern take on traditional music. Um, but I started writing in 2012 um, my own song. So pretty much everything you're going to hear except for the very last number is original music. And my writing process usually starts in the shower. <laughs> usually I have like one line and the melody attached will kind of pop into my head at some moment laying down for a nap or getting on the bus or, you know, anything where your mind's kind of free. And I'll have an idea and then it won't leave my brain. It'll get stuck in my head um, and just kind of ruminate around in there um, and gradually build on itself. So uh, maybe another line will come and then um, eventually after the song is maybe about halfway done, I can sit down and finish it. And that's so far how pretty much all of my songs have come to be. 
I would like to learn to just sit down and write a song for fun, but it always seems to come with some sort of inspiration first. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, but I think being around music and being around people that make you think is a good way to prime your brain to get ready to write. So that's sort of what I think about. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll go into the next song. This is one of those where this is exactly how it happened. The first line came and then this song tormented me for about two weeks before it was finally finished. It's called The Long Way Around um, and it's about relationships that take work but are worth it in the end and kind of that period of struggle that you might face and go through but if you make it through to the other side of that how the relationship can be richer than it was before. So this is The Long Way Around. When two souls meet and the whole world feels new, share no man's sweet, all colors bright and true, and there is laughter, and there are good things growing everywhere. And I'm happy to be. In this place with you, and I'm happy to be in this Let it out. You laid it all across the table. What's this about? And you're making me a table, and I don't wanna go down this road with you. No, I don't want to go down this road. I want to go. But I can't, and I won't tell her to so up the wounds that I broke open with you, cause I knew, and I chose, and I don't feel at home in this world anymore, no I don't feel at home in this world. Rain. 
And there is flight without landing And we learn to keep our heart in time Try not to burn the careful ties that find us together And I'm taking the long way around with you And I'm taking the long way around And I'm happy to be in this place with you And I'm taking the long way around Thank you Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Um, do you have any more questions coming your way? Yeah. So um, one question is, what's your favorite type of music? And is there a certain artist or composer that resonates with you? Well, um, over the years, it's kind of changed. But I grew up really obsessed with Simon and Garfunkel, um, probably because of the lyrics and the harmony. So I had their complete works at age 13 or something. And listen to them nonstop. Um, and then later bands like Wilco and the Decembers became really important to me, to kind of redefining what folk music could be. Um, doesn't have to just be an acoustic guitar and a singer. And I think that was good to hear them. And then uh, if I didn't, not related to my own work, my favorite genre is big band music. I just love 40s music and I'm not really sure why, but I, my parents had it on a lot growing up and it's just the genre that if I have a night free, especially if it's raining, uh, that's what I put on. So thanks for the question. Of course. <laughs> yes. Um, let me think. Oh, this next song is a fun one. It's a sing-along. Now, I know theoretically you're all there live on Zoom, and it would be cool if we could all actually unmute ourselves and sing together, but it would fail. It would not sound good. So I'm going to have to have you keep your microphones off, but I need you to sing with me nonetheless. So this um, song is about disability. It's probably the first song I wrote that really touched on disability directly. Um, when I first started performing, I loved it so much. I, I just, it really filled me up. But I wondered if um, the disability that I had would kind of create a ceiling that I wouldn't be able to break through um, to succeed as like a professional musician. And so I wrote this song kind of about the wondering about that if there would be a ceiling um and in some ways you know maybe not a ceiling but there are a lot of extra obstacles right now which is important to be talking about as the ada turns 30 and as we have so much work to do to make the art equally accessible to disabled artists and taken seriously by the rest of culture i do think about that ceiling sometimes or that those barriers but the point of the song is that nonetheless you still have to sing if it brings you joy. So I'm going to start the loop. And when I come in singing, we're going to come in together and we're going to sing this line twice. We're going to sing, Bird, why do you sing? Fate has clipped your wings. So the words are, Bird, why do you sing? Fate has clipped your wings. And I'm going to sing it with you twice, and then you are going to keep going, singing or signing at home. Just keep going in a loop all the way till the end of the song, and we will end together. And, um, and this is bird song. So do you want to practice it once at home with your mics off just to be prepared? Let's try it together. Bird, why do you sing? Fate has clipped your wings. So hopefully you got all the jitters out. And now you can sing with me at home and harmonize to bird song. So here we go.
will make me feel so free Like I just came awake, not afraid to be You make me feel like a bird in the sky Fly round and round and I can't fall down You make me feel, make me feel so free Like I just came awake, not afraid to be Thank you, Galen. Thank you. And thank you to the interpreters. I love having ASL at my shows. I wish I could do it every week. I think I will eventually because that's really important to me. And it's just, I just think it adds a lot of art to the show in itself. So I am excited to be watching. I'm trying not to get too drawn into the visuals so that I don't forget the words. But anyways, <laughs> uh, do you have a question for me, Katie? Yeah. Um, what? Um, what advice do you have for young artists with disabilities trying to get their start? That is a very good question. Um, I think the first piece is what I would say to any artist trying to get their start is to make sure that you just do as much performing as you can. Um, and don't worry about the fact that there will only be like at many shows you and the sound guy and maybe your dad or your mom or something like I did a lot of those shows and I think every artist starts out um, at a very um, small beginning and it's normal and sometimes it lasts for like 10 years so don't worry about that and then for disabled artists specifically um, I would say that don't sell yourself short um, uh, regarding accessibility like if you have needs that you um, that would help you to perform better, um, try to stand up for yourself because I think the biggest issue that I've noticed with accessibility is that venue owners, for example, or don't get asked to accommodate very often, so they think that it's just not an important issue, right? So if all of us started speaking up for what would help our shows be more accessible to us, like a ramp to the stage or a quiet, room to be before the show or any other kind of access needs like captions or lyrics um, or interpreters like the more that we start speaking up the more visible disability will become in the arts world and you'll just move things forward uh, faster which is what we all want to see um, and then the last thing I would say is that don't be afraid to look for venues outside of the mainstream to do these shows um, to stand by your values um, I've had to do, I made a commitment about two years ago not to play anywhere that wasn't accessible to the audience and that if the stage wasn't accessible that the people would not be able to lift my chair up, that I would just play on the floor because I want to start getting places to build ramps and many of them have so I've had a lot of um, success like trying to get things moving in the right direction but also there are still a lot of places I can't play. And so looking for other venues like churches um, or in some cases community centers or wellness centers, even though they're not traditional venues, have actually been a really cool community building kind of way to do things, what I like to think of as punk rock uh, accessibility. So don't waver on your own values, but don't necessarily um, say, well, I have to play at this one space, kind of make your own space and um, I just think yeah don't tell yourself short on that and then for disability the other thing I would say is um, make sure that you 
assert yourself too, um, the way people talk about your disability. Um, I've had a lot of problems in interviews and press um, with the language used, uh, negative bias language or just really ridiculous things that I did not say, such as it didn't look like she'd be able to do much with her life until she found music, things like that that are not true. And just remember that you get to own the way you talk about your disability. And so um, a lot of times that involves me saying, hey, can I read that article before you post it in case I wanna change anything? Or hey, can, before you post my video on Facebook, I just wanna see what you're gonna say um, because I have some, you know, I wanna talk about disability in a way that feels authentic to me. And I think the more artists, again, the more we can be doing this um, from the beginning, I wish it hadn't taken me so long to realize um, everyone starts at their own place. Um, but those are things I think disabled artists can be doing and know that you are part of a very cool culture that I think is just starting to be recognized by um, America in general. And disability culture has something to offer, not just because the art we make is cool, but because the perspective that we have um, is a diverse and wide ranging perspective of the world. I think that we are part of something really cool and a lot of pride in disability culture. So if you are a disabled artist starting out, know that you are uh, joining a really fun and uh, outside the box and um, prideful community and it's a pretty cool place to be. So I hope that you join us. Okay, that is all I have to say on that. Sorry, that was like 25 minutes long, but um, I'm gonna do my next song now, if that's okay. Absolutely, thanks for sharing that advice. <laughs> yes, I was like, oh man, I'm going on forever. Um, so uh, the next song is actually specifically about disability rights. And um, I wrote this song when the healthcare debates were going on and John McCain famously went on the Senate floor and put his thumb down and kind of stopped Medicaid from getting gutted. Um, and it was very stressful. And I was frustrated during this period of time because I felt like people with disabilities weren't getting heard um, very loudly about what Medicaid meant to them and what the changes would be. Um, I would read all these articles, even in progressive publications about um, you know, Medicaid and what would happen if we change, made changes. And um, a lot of times disability wasn't even mentioned in groups of people that would be affected by the change. And if it was, it was like a side note. Um, and I was just really upset to feel erased from the narrative on an issue that was so especially important to the disability community. Um, luckily, you know, in the year following or so, disability advocates started getting arrested in their senator's offices and really making a bold statements, and that kind of got the attention of mainstream media. But this song I wrote before that kind of stuff started happening, and it was this frustration of feeling left out of the dialogue and um, maybe you have laws on paper like the ADA, but they're not enforced. And so what do you do when you're fighting for change, but the change hasn't come yet? And how do you keep yourself from getting too frustrated or burned out? So that's what this song is about. It's called I Wait. It's dedicated to everybody who is uh, actively fighting for disability rights.
when you see me way in the back here. I've been waiting, I've been waiting in my been a long time. Can't get no service, still I'm hoping, I am hoping for a time. That one day things will change and we can finally take a break. That history won't forget us or just humanize our pain. And so why wait? apologize to everybody um, for any foul language they see um, in the chat. We're going to just ignore the rude people um, because we've got better things to listen to. We could, uh, do, well, I don't know if you are allowed to delete some of them, but hopefully you can block the ones that are doing that. Um, because this is a very fun concert and I am enjoying talking with you all. So thank you for sticking around. Um, so the next song I am going to do for you, oh, unless you have a question, Katie, do you have a question? I do. Um, what does the term disability pride mean to you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, disability pride um, is a concept I didn't hear about or read about until college. And it's the idea, you know, the first time I really read about it, it was like disability is not like a positive or a negative. It's just part of the spectrum of the human condition, right? The way that we all exist in the world. And that if you accept it as just like a part of your identity, like an integral part of your identity, that you can have pride in it because it makes you who you are. And especially if you um, are working to, you know, better your own situation or that you, or you have pride in your identity just as a person with value even um, in any way, like disability pride can be a real part of the way you see yourself and your community. So, so I read about that like in college and then started getting more involved with disability rights um, during college and, and afterwards. And, and disability pride not only just became something where my disability is a part of my 
identity that I can embrace, but then I realize there's this wider community out there of people that are always thinking outside the box and working for the equality of everyone. I mean, the people that I respect are really working to dismantle all forms of oppression and that the disability informs their way of operating in the world in a way that I just, I just really have, I just have a lot of pride for the people that I've met and just how cool the disability community is and how um, forward thinking and how much they've contributed to the betterment of humanity. And so all of those kind of grew my disability pride into a new, a new level of feeling like actual, like, you know, gratitude for being part of this community, I guess. So disability pride to me means that you, you don't see your disability as something that makes you in any way less than, and you embrace that as part of you, whatever that, however that impacts your life, is a part of you that will um, affect the work that you do and can be used to make the world better for everybody, if that makes any sense. It I didn't get these questions sense. ahead of time, so I'm hoping they're not too rambly. I'm trying my best. <laughs> they're not. You're, you're incredible, and I think your answer was spot on. Oh, yay. Well, thank you. I am very glad to be here, and I have two more songs for you, and then if anyone does have questions that didn't get answered, Katie and I can obviously do that later. Um, so this next song is the very first song that I have written. It, it, I wrote it back in 2012. I remember writing it because I was on the bus on my way to work, and all of a sudden this, um, these lyrics kind of started popping into my head, and I was like, wait a minute. I think I'm writing a song. I've never done that before. So um, this one is about just kind of being happy with the present moment, whatever that looks like. And it's called Grace and a Tender Hand. If I could bring you peace today, my battle would be won. You're weighted down with worry, you doubt what you are worth. You question if you'll ever know your place upon. 
Well, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Do you have another question for me? Yeah. So, um, what was your reaction when you won the NPR Tiny Desk Contest? Uh, <laughs> it was very, extremely, extremely, extremely surprising. Um, I remember I was in my lesson space because I was teaching fiddle lessons at the time, and I got an email saying, can you please call at this time, we want to talk to you. And I thought maybe I was a finalist for the contest. And so I was very, very nervous, though, um, thinking, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I'm a finalist. And then when the phone call started, it was Bob Boylan, who is the host of the show on the other end of the line, talking about my album that I had just put out. And I was like, why does he know about my album? And I was just kind of confused. And he said, we want to let you know that we want to make you the winner of the contest. And I remember thinking, this is a really, this is going to change the rest of your life, but I had no idea how, and so I just tried to really soak in the moment. So I remember what I was looking at and saying, it's one of those moments in life where you just aren't going to forget. So, um, yeah, it was really surprising, and NPR music was very cool about, you know, how do I want to talk about my disability, and what kind of accommodations do you need, and they were just so fun to work with that it was a perfect introduction to playing outside of Minnesota. They were really cool to work with. Yeah, thanks for the question, Kitty. Sure. Yeah, any other ones before I do my last song? I mean, we'll have some time after too, but if there's another sure. one you want to throw at my at my way, I guess. Um, Nancy says, your music touches my soul, and I would like to know how I can purchase CDs. Thank you. This has been a most enjoyable evening. <laughs> oh, yay. Hi, Nancy. Um, thank you so much. I do have a website, which is violinscratches.com. Um, scratches like a cat scratch. And so if somebody wants to write that in the chat, um, there's a link where you can look at all my albums and find the different ways to download them. It, but they're everywhere. They're on Spotify and um, Apple and Google Play. And Bandcamp is probably the most artist-friendly um, website to get music um, in terms of supporting the artist. Um, and then I do a live show every Sunday afternoon. Um, this week it's at 
4 o'clock Central Time, but it's almost always at 2 o'clock Central Time, where I can do some music every um, every week live um, from my living room. And I was just thinking about that <laughs> when the Zoom bomb happened, that even though that is uh, uncalled for and not cool, um, it, I still really love to play live, and that's what I love about music the most is performing for people who are right there with you. And so it's been really special to do this show. I've been looking forward to it for a long time, and especially knowing that um, so many cool people from the disability community are here um, and supportive of disability arts. And it's just, it means a lot. So thank you for sticking around live. Um, and that's sort of what my Sunday shows are like. People chat with me in between songs and we hang out and it's very fun. So thank you. Shall I do my last number, do you think? Yes, I, I think we're all ready for it. Sweet. So this is, as I said, before I started writing my own songs, I did a lot of traditional music, but I would rework it with a looping pedal. And so um, it was my way of keeping these old tunes that I had played in college. I played a lot of Celtic music, um, keeping them kind of fresh and new for me because looping requires you to be constantly uh, vigilant and on alert and so um, this is my arrangement of the parting glass and the parting glass is a celtic song that you sing at the end of parties and celebrations family gatherings holidays and for example the ada 30 celebrations so it's my way of saying good night to you and thank you so much for joining with me if you have a glass you can raise it here um, otherwise i just hope to see you all again in person sometime so this is the party left.
Kaylin, that was just stunning. Oh, thank you so much. Oh thank my gosh. Know. Thank you so much for, for playing for us tonight. Um, it was just really wonderful. The harmonies, the tone, the lyrics, absolutely everything was just wonderful. And that last song was just stunning. Oh, yay. Thank you. I love reworking that. That was one of my favorite uh, discoveries of the Celtic traditional music, making that medley. So yeah, thank you so much. Of course. It looks like we have time for just one more question. Um, and so our theme for Disability Pride Month this year was diversity includes disability. And I just love your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I guess to me, it feels so natural, right? That disability um, is part of diversity. Disability is diversity, right? It's part of the grander scheme. And to me, it means that I want to live in a society where every single person has um, an identity that is respected and um, accepted and that supported, you know, that they have the basic things that they need to access their human rights and be creative and put things out into the world. So any concept of diversity that doesn't ultimately, I mean, I think right now we're focusing on different issues because we have to, right? Because we are, we're really behind in equality when it comes to disability or Black Lives Matter. And we have a lot of work to do and we need to be focusing on those things. But the end game for me is that everybody has a seat at the table and that actually means everybody. So you have to use, you have to include disability in any of your diversity work you're doing because you'll always have disabled people. We've been here since the beginning of time and we'll continue to be here for as long as humans are around. And so we are a part of that fabric. And I just wanna see this diverse fabric of the human race um, be celebrated in all of its ways. And disability is certainly part of that. So um, I'm glad that you guys are focusing on that this year for ADA 30. And I hope someday that we're in a place where every group um, has their rights respected and their cultures appreciated. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much, Galen. This is all the time we have together. Um, we appreciate you so much for joining us for our ADA 30 finale event. Um, we ask that you 
uh, follow SDI on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to stay connected. And you can follow um, Galen on Facebook and on her website, like she mentioned, violinscratches.com. She's actually going to be joining us again on September 26th as the musical guest for our virtual party to the Max Gala. Um, and you can find more details about that at starkloff.org. But thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.